Chapter 5 Doomed There were no means known to Tommy of reckoning time in that strange place of twilight. His watch had been broken in the airplane fall, and Dodd never remembered to wind his, but they estimated that about two weeks had passed, judging from the number of times they had slept and eaten. In those two weeks, they had gradually begun to grow accustomed to their surroundings. Hadia, the girl, had arrived on Beetleback within an hour after Bram's departure, apparently into a cleft of the rocks. How he had communicated his order to the beetles' steeds, Tommy had no idea, and under the girl's ministrations, Dodd was making good progress toward recovery. That Hadia was in love with Dodd in quite a human way was evident. To please the girl, both Dodd and Tommy had learned to eat the raw shrimps, which, being bloodless, were really no worse than oysters, and had a flavor halfway between shrimp and crawfish. To please the men, Hadia tried not to shudder when she saw them devouring the breadfruit and nectarines, of which Bram always had a plentiful supply. Bram was solicitous in his inquiries for Dodd's health. Jim, I've been thinking about our chances of getting away, said Tommy one morning. It's evident Bram's only waiting for your recovery to put some proposition up to us. Suppose you were to feign paralysis. How do you mean? What for? demanded Dodd. If he thinks you're helpless, he'll be less on his guard. You haven't walked about in his presence. That was true, for the activities of the two had been nocturnal when Bram had vanished. Let him think a nerve's been severed in your neck, or something of the sort. If it doesn't work, you can always get better. Dodd's realistic portrayal of a man with a partially paralyzed right side brought cries of horror from Bram next morning. Solicitously, he helped Dodd back to the couch. Bram, when not under the influence of his drugs, had moments of human feeling. Can't you move that arm and leg at all, Dodd? he asked. No feeling in them? There's plenty of feeling, growled Dodd. But they don't seem to work, that's all. You'll get better, said Bram eagerly. You must get better. I need you, Dodd, in spite of our differences. There's work for all of us, wonderful work, a new humanity waiting to be born, Dodd, not of the miserable ape race, but of, of, he checked himself, and a cunning look came over his face. He turned away abruptly. At the end of two weeks or so, an amazing thing happened. One day, Hadia, with a look of triumph, in her eyes addressed Dodd with a few English words. Her brain, which had probably developed certain faculties in different proportions from those of the upper human race, had registered every word that either of the two men had ever spoken, and remembered it. As soon as Dodd ascertained this, he began to instruct her, and with her abnormal faculties of memory, it was not long before she could talk quite intelligently. The obstacle that had stood between them was swept away. She became one of themselves. In the days that followed, the girl told them brokenly something of the history of her race, of the legend of the universal flood that had driven them down into the bowels of the earth, of the centuries-long struggle with the beetles, and of the insect's gradual conquest of humanity, and the final reduction of the human race to a miserable, helpless remnant. Everywhere, Hadia told them, were beetle swarms. Everywhere, humanity had been reduced to a few handfuls. Bram, by breeding mankind from prolific strains, and using the newborn progeny for food, had temporarily averted universal starvation but a new swarm of beetles was due to hatch out shortly, and then the girl with a shudder put her hand to her bosom and brought out a little bright-eyed lizard. The old man you saw me with, who is one of our wise elders, 
has told our people that these things feed upon the beetle larvae she said we are putting them secretly into the nests but what can a few lizards do against millions she looked up in the earth above us the beetle larvae extended for miles in a solid mass she said when they come out as beetles it will be the end of all of us bram had grown less suspicious as the time passed his sudden visits to the cavern had ceased dodd and tommy knew that he spent the nights if they could be termed nights lying in a drugged slumber somewhere among the rocks they had asked hadia whether there was any way of escape into the upper world there are two ways from here answered the girl one is the way you came but it is impossible to pass the beetle guards without being torn to pieces the other she shuddered and for an instant drew back the film across her pupils then uttered a little cry of pain at the light dim though it was there is a bridge across that terrible monster that devours all it touches she said shuddering meaning the fire suddenly dodd had an inspiration he still had the fur coat that he had worn and reaching into a pocket he drew out a pair of snow goggles which he adjusted over hadia's nose look now he said hadia looked blinked and with an effort kept her eyes open she gazed at dodd in amazement dodd laughed and pulled her toward him he kissed her and hadia's eyes closed what is this she murmured first you gave me medicine that opened my eyes and then you give me medicine that closes them that's nothing grinned dodd wait till you understand me better bram's eyes were preternaturally bright it was evident that he had been increasing his dose of late and that he was fully under the influence of it now well gentlemen the time has come for us to be frank with one another he said as the three gathered about the little table while hadia crouched in a far corner of the cave i want you to work for me in my plans for the regeneration of humanity the time for which i have long labored is almost at hand any day now the new swarm of beetles may emerge from the pupil stage but before i speak further come and see them gentlemen he rose and dodd and tommy rose too tommy supporting dodd who let his arm and leg trail awkwardly as he moved bram led the way into the cleft among the rocks into which he had been in the habit of passing beyond this opening the two men saw another smaller cavern with a beetle guard standing on either side antenna waving bram shrilled a sound and the antenna dropped the three passed through tommy saw a haircloth pallet set against the rocks a table and a chair beyond was a sloping ramp of earth overhead was a rock ceiling bram led the way up the ramp and the three stepped through a gap in the rocks and found themselves on an extensive prairie but in place of the red grass there was a vast sea of mud by the light cast by the petrol fire which roared up in the distance a veritable fiery fountain the two americans could see that the mud was filled with huge encysted forms grubs three or four feet long motionless in the soil bram scooped up one of them and tossed it into the air it thudded to their feet and remained motionless as far as you can see and for miles beyond these pupa of the beetles lie buried in the decaying vegetation in which the eggs were hatched said bram every century and a half so far as i have been able to judge from comparative anatomy a fresh swarm emerges see he pointed to the pupa he had unearthed which as if stirred into activity by his handling was now beginning to move or rather something was moving inside the cocoon the shell broke and the hideous head and folded antenna of a beetle appeared with a convulsive writhing 
the monster threw off the covering and stepped out. It extended its wings, glistening with moisture, from the still soft and pliant carapace, or shell, and suddenly zoomed off into the distance. Tommy shuddered as the boom of its flight grew softer and subsided. Any day now the entire swarm will emerge, cried Bram. How many moltings they undergo before they undergo the finished state, I do not know. But already, as you see, they are prepared for the battle of life. They emerge ravenous. The beetle will fall upon the man-herds and devour a full-grown human unless the guards destroy it. He raised his arms with the gesture of an ancient prophet. Woe to the human race, he cried. The wretched ape spawn that has cast out its teachers and persecuted those who sought to raise it to higher things. Tommy knew that Bram was referring to himself. Bram turned fiercely upon Dodd. When I joined the Greystoke expedition, he cried, it was with the express intention of refuting your miserable theories as to the fossil monotremes. I could not sleep or eat, so deeply was I affronted by them. For if they were true, the Dasyuridae are an innovation in the great scheme of nature and man, instead of being a mere afterthought. A jest of the creative force came to earth with a purpose. That I deny, he yelled. Man is a joke. Nature made him when she was tired, as the architect of a cathedral fashion of gargoyle in a sportive moment. It is the insect not the man, who is the predestined lord of the ages. And for once in his life, perhaps because at this point Tommy dug him violently in the ribs, Dodd had the sense to remain silent. Bram led the way swiftly back into the larger cave. When this swarm hatches out, he said, I calculate that there will be a trillion beetles seeking food. There is no food for a tithe of them here underneath the earth. What then? Do you realize their stupendous power, their invincibility? No, you don't realize it, because your minds, through long habit, are only attuned to think in terms of man. All man's long history of slaughter of the so-called lure creatures obsesses you, blinds your understanding. A beetle? something to be trodden underfoot, crushed in sport. But I tell you, gentlemen, that nature, God, if you will, has designed to supplant the man-ape by the beetle. He has resolved to throw down the wretched so-called intelligence of your kind and mine and supplant it by the divine instinct of the beetle, an instinct that is infinitely superior because it arrives at results instantaneously. It knows where man infers. Attuned closely to nature, it alone is able to fulfill the divine plan of creation. Bram was certainly under the influence of his drugs. Nevertheless, so violent were his gestures, so inspired was his utterance, that Tommy and Dodd listened almost in awe. They are invincible, Bram went on. Their fecundity is such that when the new swarm is hatched out, their members alone will make them irresistible. They do not know fear. They shrink from nothing, and they will follow me, their leader, I who know the means of controlling them. How, then, can puny man hope to stand against them? Join me, gentlemen, Bram went on, and beware how you decide rashly. For this is the supreme moment, not only for your own lives, but for all humanity and beetledom. Upon your decision hangs the future of the world. For irresistible as the beetles are, there is one thing they lack. That is the sense of historic continuity. If they destroy man, they will know nothing of man's achievements, poor though these are my own work on the fossil monotremes. Which is a tissue of inaccuracies and half-baked deductions, shouted Dodd. Bram 
started as if a whip had lashed him. Liar, he bawled. Do you think that I, who left the Greystoke expedition in a howling blizzard, because I knew that here in the inner earth I could refute your miserable impostures, do you think that I am in the mood to listen to your wretched farrago of impossibilities? Listen to me, bawled Dodd, advancing with waving arms, once and for all. Let me tell you that your deductions are all based on fallacious premises. No, I will not shut up, Tom Travers. You want me to aid your damn beetles in the destruction of humanity? I tell you that your phascalotherium, amphitherium, and all the rest of them, including the marsupial lion, are degenerate developments of the age following the Pleistocene. I say the whole insect world was made to fertilize the plant world, so that it should bear fruit for human food. Man is the summit of the scale of evolution, and I will never join in any infamous scheme for its destruction. Bram glared at Dodd like a madman. Three times he opened his mouth to speak, but only inarticulate sounds came from his throat. And when at last he did speak, he said something that neither Dodd nor Tommy had anticipated. It looks as if you're not so paralyzed as you made out, he sneered. You'll change your mind within what used to be called a day, Dodd. You'll crawl to my feet and beg for pardon, and you'll recant your lying theories about the fossil monotremes, or you die, the pair of you. You die. Chapter 6 Escape I heard what he said. You shall not die. We shall go away to your place, where there are no beetles to eat us, even if, Hadia shuddered, even if we have to cross the bridge of fire, beyond which, they tell me, lies freedom. High over and a little to one side of the petrol flame, Dodd and Tommy had seen the slender arc of rock leading into another cleft in the rocks. They had investigated it several times, but always the fierce heat had driven them back. Both Dodd and Tommy had noticed, however, that at times the fire seemed to shrink in volume and intensity. Observation had shown them that these times were periodical, recurring about every twelve hours. I think I've got the clue, Tommy, said Dodd, as the three watched the fiery fountain and speculated on the possibility of escape. That flow of petrol is controlled like the tides on the earth, by the pull of the moon. Just now it is at its height. I've noticed that it loses pretty nearly half its volume at its alternating phase. If I'm right, we'll make the attempt in about twelve hours. Bram's given us twenty-four, said Tommy. But how about getting Hadia across? I go where you go, said Hadia, sidling up to Dodd and looking down upon him lovingly. I do not afraid of fire. If it burn me up, I go to good place. Where's that, Hadia? asked Dodd. When we die, we go to a place where it is always dark, and there are no beetles, and the ground is full of shrimps. We leave our bodies behind, like the beetles, and fly about happy forever. Not a bad sort of place, said Dodd, squeezing Hadia's arm. If you think you are ready to try to cross the bridge, we'll start as soon as the fire gets lower. I'll be on the job, answered Hadia unconsciously reproducing a phrase of Tommy's. The girl glided away and disappeared through the thick of the beetle crowd clustered about the entrance to the cavern. Tommy and Dodd had already discovered that it was through her ability to reproduce a certain beetle sound meaning not good to eat that the girl could come and go. They had once tried it on their own account and had narrowly escaped the lashing tentacles. After that, there was nothing to do but wait. Three or four hours must have passed when Bram returned from his inner cave. Well, Dodd, 
Have you experienced a change of heart? He sneered. If you knew what's in store for you, maybe you'd come to the conclusion that you've been too cocksure about the monotremes. We're slaughtering in the morning. That's so? asked Dodd. That's so! shouted Bram. The beetles are beginning to emerge from the pupae, and they'll need food if they're to be kept quiet. We're rounding up about three score of the culls. Your friend Hadia will be among them. We've got some caged ichnunium flies, pretty little things, only a foot long, which will sting them in certain nerve centers, rendering them powerless to move. Then we shall bury them, standing up in the vegetable mold, for the beetles to devour alive as soon as they come out of the shells. You'll feel pretty, Dodd, standing there unable to move, with the newborn beetles biting chunks out of you. Tommy shuddered, despite his hopes of their escaping. Bram, for a scientist, had a grim and picturesque imagination. Dodd, there is no personal quarrel between us, Bram went on. Again, that note of pathetic pleading came into his voice. Give up your mad ideas. Admit that the banded anteater, at least, existed before the Pleistocene epoch, and everything can be settled. When you see what my beetles are going to do to humanity, you'll be proud to join us. Only make a beginning. You remember the point I made in my paper about the Spallocotherium in the Upper Jurassic Rocks? It would convince anybody but a hardened fanatic. I read your paper, and I saw your so-called Spallocotherium reconstructed from what you called a jawbone, shouted Dodd. That so-called jawbone was a lump of chalk, made porous by water, and the rest was in your imagination. Do your worst, Bram. I'll never crucify truth to save my life, and I'll laugh at your spallocotherium when your beetles are eating me. Bram yelled and shrieked. He stamped up and down the cavern, shaking his fists at Dodd. At last, with a final torrent of objurgation, he disappeared. A pleasant customer, said Tommy. We'll have to make that bridge, Jim, no question about it, even if it means death in the petrol fire. Fire's dying down fast, answered Dodd. Hadia ought to be here soon. If Bram hasn't got her. Bram got... That girl... If Bram harms a hair on her head, I'll kill him with worse tortures than he's ever dreamed of, answered Dodd, leaping up white with rage. You mean you... Tommy began. Love her? Yes, I love her, shouted Dodd. She's a girl in a million, just the sort of helpmate I need to assist me in my work when we get back. I tell you, Tommy, I didn't know what love meant before I saw Hadia. I laughed at it as a romantic notion. Oh, lyric love, half angel and half bird, he quoted, beginning to stride up and down the cavern, while Tommy watched him in amazement. And at this moment, a complete beetle entered the cave, complete because it had a plastron or breast shell, as well as a back shell or carapace, a double breast shell, a new species of beetle, an executioner beetle, sent by Bram to summon them to the torture? Tommy shuddered, but Dodd, lost in his love ecstasy, was ignorant of the creature's advent. Oh, lyric love, he shouted again as he twisted on his heel to run smack into the monster. The crack of Dodd's head against the beetle shell re-echoed through the cave. The double plastron dropped, the carapace fell down. Hadia stood revealed. The lovers, folded in each other's arms, passed momentarily into a trance. It was Tommy who separated them. "'We'll have to make a move,' he said. "'I think the fire's as low as it ever gets. "'Why did you bring the shells, Hadia?' "'To save us all from the beetles,' answered the girl. "'When they see us in the shells, they will not know we are human. "'That is what makes it so hard to have to be eaten by those beetles.' When they are such dumbbells, she added, reproducing another of Tommy's words. Come, she continued bravely, let us see if we can pass the fire. 
The roaring fountain made the air a veritable inferno. Overhead, the rocks were red-hot. A cascade of sparkles tumbled in a fiery shower from the rock roof. Dodd, holding Hadia in his arms to protect her, staggered ahead, with Tommy in the rear. Only the beetle shells, which acted as non-conductors of the heat, made that fiery passage possible. There was one moment when it seemed to Tommy as if he must let go and drop into the raging furnace underneath. He heard Dodd bawling hoarsely in front of him. He nerved himself to a last effort, beating fiercely at his blazing hair, and then the heat was past, and he had dropped unconscious upon a bed of cool earth beside a rushing river. He was vaguely aware of being carried in Dodd's arms, but a long time seemed to have passed before he grew conscious again. He opened his eyes in utter darkness. Dodd was whispering in his ear. "'Tommy, old man, how are you feeling?' Dodd asked. "'All... all right,' Tommy muttered. "'How's Hadia?' "'Still unconscious, poor girl. We've got to get out of here. I heard Bram yelling in the distance. He's discovered our flight. There may be another way out of the cave, and, if so, he'll stop at nothing to get us.' See if you can stand, but keep your head low. There's a low roof of rock above us. There's water, said Tommy, listening to the roar of a torrent that seemed to be rushing past them. It's a stream, and I believe these shells will float and bear our weight. We've got to try. We've got to put everything to the touch now, Tommy. I'm going to lay Hadia on one of the shells, poor girl, and start her off. Then I'll follow and you can bring up the rear. I'm with you, said Tommy, getting up on his feet, and uttering an exclamation of pain as, forgetful of Dodd's injunction, he let his head strike the rock roof overhead. In the darkness he felt the outlines of his beetle shell lying beside the torrent. He could hear Dodd in front of him, grunting as he raised Hadia's unconscious form in his arms, and deposited her in her shell. Tommy got his own shell into the stream and held it there as the waters swirled around it. Ready? he heard Dodd call. Before he could answer, there sounded from not far away, yet strangely muffled by the rocks, Bram's bellow of fury. Bram was evidently fully drugged and beside himself. Inarticulate threats came floating through the rocky chamber. Bram seems to have lost his head temporarily, called Dodd, laughing. A madman, Tommy. He insists that the marsupial lion— Yes, I heard you telling him about it, answered Tommy. You handed it to him straight. However, more about the marsupial lion later. I'm ready. Then let her go, called Dodd, and his words were swallowed up by the sound— of the hollow shell striking against the rocky bank as he launched his strange craft into the water. Tommy set one foot into the hollow of his shell and let himself go. Instantly the shell shot forward with fearful velocity. It was all Tommy could do to balance himself, for it seemed more unstable than a canoe. Once or twice he thought he heard Dodge shouting ahead of him, but his cries were drowned in the rush of the torrent. Suddenly a light appeared in the distance. Tommy thought it was another of the petroleum fountains, and his heart seemed to stand still, but then he gave a gasp of relief. It was a cluster of luminous fungi, ten or twelve feet tall, emitting a glow equal to that of a dozen forty-watt electric bulbs. By that infernal light, Tommy could see that the stream curved sharply. It was about fifty feet in width, and the low rock roof had receded to some fifteen feet overhead. Instead of a tunnel, there was nothing on either side of them but a vast tract of marshy ground thinly coated with the red grass. As Tommy looked, he saw the shell that carried the unconscious body of Hadia strike the bank beside the phosphorescent growth. He could see the girl lying in the hollow of the shells, a pale as death, 
her eyes closed. Dodd was close behind. As the swirl of the current caught his shell, he turned to shouting a warning to Tommy. And Tommy noticed a singular thing, of which his sense of balance had already warned him, though he had hardly given conscious thought to the matter. The river was running uphill. Of course it was, since the center of gravity was in the shell of the earth and not in the center. But again, the shell of the earth was under their feet. Then Tommy hit on the solution to the problem. If the river was running uphill, that meant that they must be near the exterior of the earth. In other words, they had passed the center of gravity. They must be within a mile or so of the exit from Submundia. Tommy was about to shout his discovery to Dodd when his shell grounded beside the two others at the base of a clump of fungi. Huge, straight, hollow stems they were, with mushroom caps, and, like all fungi, fly-blown. For Tommy could see worms nearly a foot in length crawling in and out of the porous stalks. The stench from the growth was nauseating and overpowering, utterly sickening. "'Push off, and let's get out of here,' Tommy called to Dodd, who was balancing his shell against the bank and trying to peer into Hadia's face. At that moment he caught sight of something that made his blood turn cold. It was an insect, fully fifteen feet in height, three times that of a beetle, lurking among the fungi. He saw a hugely elongated neck, a three-cornered head with a pair of tentacles, and two pairs of legs as long as a giraffe's. But what gave the added touch of horror was that the monster, balancing itself on its hind legs, had its forelegs extended in the attitude of one holding a prayer book. That attitude of devotion was so terrible that Tommy uttered a wild cry of terror. At the same time, another cry broke from Dodd's lips. God! A praying mantis! he shouted struggling madly to push off his shell and Hadia's. The next moment, as if shot from a catapult, the hideous monster launched itself into the air straight toward them. 